books. I have used four of his uh, licensed books to obtain four of the ham radio licenses that I have achieved. And thank you very much for that. And um, as well as other things, thank you for doing what you do to further the ham radio. And um, without any further ado, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. West, for being here, and you had the con. Well, uh, thank you, Wayne, and a very good morning to the, uh, let me get this right, Southern Canadian, but you're in <laughs> Oklahoma. Is that right? I got yeah. I got to get this uh, squared away. But anyway, it is a uh, delight to be here with you. And um, <clears throat> we're going to talk all about tropo ducting. But uh, before we do, um, I want to say I'm delighted to have listened to all of you for the half hour before we started, because you're real hams. Uh, you're not just uh, there in front of a computer looking at a screen and saying, oh, I made that. Con oh, I got another contact. No, you did it the old fashioned way to get where you are today. So um, we're going to talk about tropospheric ducting. And we're going to talk about the two meter band and the 440 band. And, um, you know, a lot of hams have gone before us on the two meter band. And um, we're not going to talk about long range moon bounds. No, this is moon bounds. Boy, those were the days. Now we can do it, of course, on. Uh, uh, MSK 144 and other uh, digital modes. Uh, we're not going to talk about satellites either, but satellites were sort of fun because um, <clears throat> you would uh, uh, remember that as the satellites are rolling, uh, the conversation would come in and out. Right, so and out. So and of course, it would always roll uh, when they would give their call sign. So you had no idea what their call sign was other than a five or a four. <laughs> Those were the days. Um, and um, we, uh, we know that CW is going to live forever because for working meteors, uh, this is what a CW signal sounds like coming off of a meteor. And Only a ham could appreciate that noise, huh? Well, if you're um, uh, up uh, near the Canadian border, we have the opportunity to work Aurora, and here's what Aurora sounds like. Yeah, neat stuff. But again, it points out that CW lives. And uh, so far, no computer has uh, beat out our brain and be able to pick out these CW signals. Uh, finally, before we get into tropo, uh, we know that uh, the ionosphere uh, gives a wide signal, something called phase distortion. And it's always funny. Just when the fellow's ready to give his QSL information, uh, he goes in the phase distortion. Now, this is FM on the 10 and 6 meter bands. Take a listen to this phase distortion. Okay, I am located in Stonehill, Massachusetts. That's uh, S T O N. And <laughs> in that, the truth, always going into the big phase. Well, let's take a little look at uh, what uh, tropospheric ducting is all about. And before we go into our next slide, um, the, the troposphere is that area of our atmosphere just above uh, ground level. And the troposphere is what we call the weather layer. And the weather layer is constantly giving us all sorts of excitement uh, because it does something very interesting. Back in the 1798 period, Gasparo Mange was able to actually see uh, through tropospheric ducting um, targets uh, visually that were 80 miles away, but they were upside down. 
in Greenland, and we're going to see an upside down target uh, today. Greenland was able to see all the way across the Atlantic on one morning, and the landmass was also upside down. Well, in the 1935s, 1938, um, phantom signals were coming all over the place. It was 33 that Marconi and Mr. Hall were able to span 258 kilometers via the ionosphere. But things were happening in the atmosphere, that area right above us, the weather layer. And Hawaii in 1940, with their early and they were on the two meter band around 144 megahertz. Uh, Hawaii <clears throat> was uh, beginning to say what's going on. And they could actually see on certain days, usually in July, the mainland of the United States coming back as a radar echo. In 1950, the Navy inaugurated the trade winds experiment and discovered that in June, July, and August, there was a regular path between Southern California and Hawaii. And good old hams, we explored that on the 220 megahertz band when John uh, was able, W6NLZ, John Chambers, able to make contact with Ralph, cage 6 uk uh, on uh, AM. In 57, we made it on uh, FM and CW, 1970, went up to 432 and made the contact between the USA and Hawaii. And then after that, all the way up to, in 1994, 5,760. But we were never able to uh, get up to 10,000 megs, and that's what we're going to be looking at next. All right, we'll go to our first slide. And we know that line of sight uh, is uh, calculated on these nomographs. And if you're not line of sight on the nomograph, well, comms are probably not likely. Well, they gave us a 10% fudge factor, but uh, nonetheless, uh, line of sight played a very important part on uh, being able to calculate if we're gonna be able to make uh, a uh, contact. So remember the line of sight. <clears throat> It's not line of sight from the west coast of uh, Hawaii uh, to the west coast of the United States. Make that the east coast of Hawaii uh, to uh, the USA mainly. Uh, that's in Monterey County on Hughes Ridge. That's uh, still in Connecticut. Early Hotel Echo Whiskey CL. Hughes Ridge. And uh, about 18 miles uh, this was a recording that came out of Hawaii on being able to tune in to some of Southern California's two meter and 432, 440 repeaters. That's 2,500 miles. So you can see that uh, it's quite a deal in usually July. And that's when the tropospheric ducting really begins. Well, again, the troposphere is that lowest layer to the earth. They call it the weather layer. And we know the weather layer that for every 300 feet of uh, altitude going up 300 feet, we lose one degree Fahrenheit. So the higher we go, it gets colder. Um, the um, temperature at 5,000 feet would then to be 20 degrees colder. Moisture, as we go up uh, 1,000 feet, we lose a half a gram of uh, little water droplets floating around. Pressure decreases logarithmically. So at one kilometer, we've lost 100 millibars. Normally, our pressure is 29.53. Well, what's all this weather stuff? Uh, how does that have anything to do with tropospheric ducting? Well, the big weather maker in the troposphere are the high pressure systems that begin to float in from the west going to the east. And when these high pressure systems stall, the weatherman and weather woman will say, well, we're gonna have two or three days of hot weather. It's gonna be smoggy and sticky. That's the time that we ought to get on the two meter and 440 band and start exploring what else is out there beside our local signal. As that high pressure system settles in, it traps the smog, it traps all the air pollutants, and it traps it anywhere from about uh, 
500 feet to up to 1,000 feet above us. And you can see that, and we'll see that shortly in some of the uh, slides here. So the weather layer creates this inversion. And the reason the temperature all of a sudden goes up instead of decreasing with height that we just explored, that's because that high pressure system is beginning to drop because it's heavier air than the air below it. And that dropping of air is called subsidence. Well, it drops down to about 1,000 feet, and then at about 1,000 feet, uh, this dropping air begins to layer. And we'll see that with a laser a little uh, toward the end of the show. These layers then will stack up, and if the layer is 8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the air above it, which is usually dry and cold, as well as eight degrees warmer than the air below it down at uh, the deck. Uh, that air is usually uh, a little more moist and uh, it's colder as well. This high pressure duct is the tropospheric duct that runs its magic on not only mirages that we see on a roadway down low, but this high pressure duct is the one that creates a nice waveguide for VHF and UHF radio waves. And we've calculated that while six meters sometimes is affected by tropospheric ducting, truly it is the two meter band, 220, 440, and it is mode independent. So here's that warm air duct capped by cool dry air and uh, sometimes uh, uh, nice cold air below it. Um, our line of sight would only go uh, maybe uh, 50 or 60 miles on the two meter band. But wow, when tropospheric ducting comes in, it gets caught up into this band of uh, seven or eight or nine degrees warmer air. That band can be either 300 uh, meters thick or sometimes only 10 meters thick. And the wider the band of the warm air tropospheric duct, the lower the frequency. And the more narrow that duct, the more pronounced it is, the higher uh, frequency uh, we can uh, operate on. So this is a good look at what's happening. <clears throat> it occurs every June, July, and August, but sometimes even in May. And that's like a couple weeks away. So the high pressure system, you can see on the weather charts, there's also Hepburn uh, does a, a wonderful um, uh, calculation of where all the high pressure cells are. And what we're looking for is that dry stagnant air, that subsidence inversion. <clears throat> if we were to look at uh, temperature on the left-hand side, it's progressively going to get colder as we go higher. Remembering that normal air uh, temperature is going to decrease one degree Fahrenheit for every 300 feet of altitude. And going up to 5,000 feet, that temperature again is going to be 20 degrees colder. But here at about three or 4,000 feet, bango, it all of a sudden becomes warmer. And that is what we call the tropospheric duct. And that's when the hams ought to get ready. Again, you can tell that you're probably going to have tropospheric ducting throughout all of the United States from the West Coast to the East Coast by looking at your weather maps and seeing where that high pressure cell is. <clears throat> And going outside and physically looking at uh, the tropospheric uh, duct as what would be smoke hanging in the air. And it's usually right there at the inversion layer. Uh, this is in Denver, Colorado. And they were working stations all the way down in Texas because they had this high pressure cell overhead. The air began to sink and it settled in, this case, maybe only a thousand feet above uh, the uh, area. And you can actually see uh, what's happening there with the tropospheric uh, obscuring some of the uh, mountains uh, lower in altitude. Here on the West Coast, something eerie happens in July. And that is we can look out at the ocean and while well, we see a sailboat naturally, and we've got some surface winds, 
Uh, we've noticed all day that there's been a band of brown air sort of hanging over the water. And if you look carefully, you can see the lighter color and then it turns into a very dark. Well, those are clouds. No, they're not. They're actually reflections off of a super tanker that is waiting to come into the LA Long Beach Harbor. And it skews that for about 50 or 60 degrees. So that's actually not a cloud, but a form of a reflection, sort of like in a mirage. And uh, it's a very eerie sight uh, when we're looking out here and uh, seeing that. There's another great shot. And again, that black is not clouds. It's actually uh, an optical illusion. Uh, the oil rigs offshore, all of a sudden during tropospheric ducting, they look uh, a lot longer and uh, it's so eerie. Now here's what's happening. Take a look, land mass off to the right and just off the tip of the land mass going left is well, what is it? Is it clouds? No, that is a reflection of the land off to the right in a thin band. <laughs> Look at that super tanker out there on the water. During tropospheric ducting, whoa, is that smoke coming on? No, it's not smoke. It is an optical illusion. And if you look carefully at the landmass to the right, uh, you see that it's pretty distinctive above the tropo, but in the tropo, it's sort of blurred, and that's where the temperature has gone up. Well, you can imagine the party goers uh, in um, uh, Florida <clears throat> uh, during Easter vacation uh, several years ago that said, I think I'm going to put down my drink and stop drinking completely. Uh, this would be the ha the uh, uh, Easter weekend crowd, <laughs> because I just saw a boat go by with a boat on top of it upside down. Now, I don't know if we can do the video, but let's see if maybe we can maneuver that uh, computer around to uh, do the video. And uh, here we go. And, and yeah, there we, whoa, what the heck is going on here? Yeah, perfect tropospheric ducting condition. And that is this tanker is looking upside down. Now notice to the rear of the tanker, all that black area, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, the optical illusion that is taking place uh, via tropo. So now we'll go back to uh, the slide that we had just a few moments ago. <clears throat> and uh, we're giving everybody a good workout on it. So these things will trap, that is these things meaning the tropospheric duct, in their eight to 10 degree uh, warmer temperature, trap a narrow band of radio frequencies as well as optically uh, transform the signal to go and go and go. So again, during the summer months, July is usually the best month for tropospheric ducting due to the high pressure system that comes in from the West, we actually send it your direction. <laughs> it ends up as tropospheric ducting. And the warm air inversion can be seen easily. It's one of those days where you go, oh gosh, it's hot. There's no wind. And I see this band of brown air above me. That's the time to get inside and start tuning around. And I first suggest tune around to the weather stations up at 162, 400 and higher. If you're able to hear weather stations, go to one not in your area. Just pick one that's normally like Weather Channel 3 or Weather Channel 5. If you have one of those little weather monitors. And you may be surprised that, whoa. I'm getting weather reports. Go to your two meter that usually has out of band uh, receive capabilities. Start tuning around. Oh my goodness, that's a weather station coming in 200 miles away. Yeah, that's happening. So tropospheric ducting, very mysterious on the way it looks. And many times in the early morning hours as the atmosphere is beginning to settle into layers, we'll have strange things occur. The breakwater is in the foreground, but 
Behind it, 26 miles away, is a small island we call Catalina Island. And while it has a narrow, uh, low area of landmass, look at this, it opens wide open. In other words, the island doesn't look anything like it should. Well, before uh, computers uh, took over the ham radio monitoring, the ham radio operators would tune in and we would listen for the Hawaiian beacon that was on two meters, 222, 432, 1296. And we would listen with uh, open squelch. We would listen in the CW or sideband mode, uh, watching uh, and listening for anything coming in. Uh, as the more modern radios came in, we'd use noise reduction, digital signal processing, and we listen for the beacon that's on 24 hours a day, coming from Hawaii, uh, all the way left, all the way to us, all the way right. And when we see cloud patterns like this, this is a good view of what tropospheric ducting is all. Can you hear the beacon? Oh, it's now can you hear the beacon? Hear the beacon? See if we can hear the beacon. The beacon uh, put up by Lou, N6CA, and um, uh, others, the, uh, the beacon uh, had an unregulated power supply on the final tone at the end. So after the KH6HME call sign, <laughs> listen for the rise of the tone. And that was great because uh, many of us operating DSP, uh, that changing tone frequency would be enough to get through DSP. Listen for the rise of the final uh, dash. Whoop. <laughs> yep. That was definitely Hawaii coming in. And we could tell by the Hepburn report, go to dxinfocenter.com forward slash tropo. Uh, and DX Info Center uh, ends with T-R-E, not C-E-N-T-E-R, but T-R-E. Uh, this is the William Hepburn report. And as you can see, uh, he does a world map, and then he also does the USA and the East Coast, uh, Midwest, as well as East Coast. And uh, where we see the uh, red areas, that's area of intense tropospheric ducting or temperature inversion. In the old days, we would use these to see when we were going to get television DX on uh, TV channels 2 through 6 sometimes even channel seven on television. But since we've gone from analog to digital, there's not a lot of reports coming in uh, via the old way of looking at the TV and seeing the little crosshatch uh, marks. So the unstable patch shows ducting interruptions on this particular case. Uh, while we do have some red areas, it's not continuous. Now, looking at the USA, we see that Texas has a uh, opening and their opening is beginning to form between uh, Texas and Florida. And tropospheric ducting is um, uh, fairly common uh, between the Midwest to the South, between the Midwest all the way to the East of the Great Lakes. East Coast many times from Nova Scotia will hear repeaters on FM uh, all the way down from Florida. The Florida Keys, that's a hot spot for VHFers and UHFers, so weak signal operators. Uh, they'll pick up signals from Texas. And again, we tune around the band. And if we hear a lot of repeaters that normally we don't hear at Key West, that tells us the band is opening up. Plus the telltale, look at the uh, weather map and look for that high pressure system.
So tropospheric ducting on this particular day is uh, not huge uh, up in your neck of the woods. The letter U means it's unsettled, which means it's got clouds and there's other weather systems coming in. What creates tropospheric ducting is that still, still weather with uh, almost uh, no wind. Um, as hams in Hawaii, hams are amazing. This is Paul Lee, K8686. We're located on the side of the Pahala, uh, which is a volcano. Imagine the beacon site in Hawaii is on the side of the Mauna Loa volcano. And there were periods when Paul, K86HME, unfortunately silent key now, uh, uh, was not able to get to the beacon site uh, directly because of lava flows. Is this dedication of a ham radio operator? You bet. And what he would do is uh, when uh, folks would uh, call him on the telephone and say, Paul, we're hearing the beacon. Get up to the beacon site. He would drop everything he's doing and say, no problem. I'm into it. He'd load up uh, his gear all ready to roll, and he would drive the three hours up to the beacon site. As he's driving up to the beacon site, and I went up there once with him, he had his FM radio uh, tuned in on his car, and all of a sudden, I'm hearing music. And now I'm hearing station identification. This is XC2, blah, 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 in Baja, California. We were getting tropo FM signals on the FM music band, and we could literally see when we were inside the tropospheric duct. But the higher we went, the music disappeared. Paul said not to worry. And when we got to the beacon site, it was at that sweet spot. Uh, on the mountain, and Paul described it. 8,200 foot elevation. 8,200 foot elevation on the side of an active volcano. 8,200 foot. And we're about 25 miles west of the easternmost shore of the, of the island, not in the center of the island. Now, remember, this is Paul coming in on, two, on 432. 432, but listen to the mode. Uh, we worked him for hours via tropospheric ducting. I'm in California and he's in Hawaii. Listen. So, uh, how does that uh, coming out there? Is the uh, signal strength still holding up to the garden? Yeah, it sure is, Paul. Tell us what mode you're on and tell us what frequency over. Uh, we're on. Uh, 432.074 Okay, Paul, how far apart do you think we are? <laughs> wow. And you know, the, the beacon site is now automated, uh, running all the digital modes, and uh, operators say, yeah, yeah, we got Hawaii yesterday. Yeah, you may have got them on your computer, but nothing beats the real world of somebody busting their butt to get to the top of an active volcano. And you're out there listening to uh, the uh, hash coming in. Uh, it's amazing uh, that um, the thrill uh, is is almost gone because uh, folks are just doing it automatically rather than the good old hams that just listen and listen and listen. And here's one. We didn't think at the very beginning that anything more than CW would make the 2,500 mile path. Well, then we introduced single sideband and sure enough, the path is there. But somebody said, no, it'll never work on FM because of, as we heard earlier, phase distortion or something like that. And as you can see, when Paul gets up to the beacon site, that's all the silver stuff on the right. Um, the, uh, he brings his transceiver with him and he brought a multi-mode transceiver. And we first started out on sideband and we were the very first, uh, I think, in um, the uh, USA to say, well, let's let's go to wide uh, FM, you know, plus or minus five kilohertz, and see if it'll work. Take a listen. 
So FM made it. We thought, wow. And it made it so strong all the way up to 432. We thought, gosh, we're on the uh, 432 uh, band. Uh, let's try amateur slow scan, excuse me, amateur fast scan television, six megahertz wide. We made it. Fast scan television from the top of the Mauna Loa volcano all the way to the West Coast. Now, the antennas are um, good old Yaggies. I think those are RIW, two RIW Yaggies. And there's a two for the two meter band, four for the 432 band. Uh, they have four for the 1296 band. And we have different dishes for microwaves because I'm into microwaves. But look at this. This was the reception of the signal coming in from Hawaii on amateur television, six megahertz wide. Absolutely unbelievable. It stayed um, uh, clear for about 15 minutes at the peak of the tropo duct. And while the peak finally subsided and the picture went into mush, and this is uh, analog, um, we then uh, couldn't see it, but we could still talk uh, not as strong on some of the bands. So this is uh, what um, uh, we've uh, been able to accomplish, and that is comms all the way up to 5.7 gigahertz. And uh, that's Paul. Hopefully that's not turned on while he's standing right there, but it's not high power. All of these contacts are below 100 watts. And when we go to microwave, we're usually at the two to five watt level, not with any traveling wave tubes. There's CHIP in 6CA. And again, CHIP is the one that uh, has developed all of these uh, uh, transmitters, all of the beacons uh, out of his own pocket. And uh, he lives in uh, Torrance, but drives uh, about 20 minutes to a secret spot up on uh, a hill called San Pedro Hill, Palos Verdes. He sets up his mobile. And again, he could probably do this at his house uh, on a computer, but nothing beats getting out there and just uh, putting up your own antennas and the thrill of being able to turn them toward Hawaii and actually hear the Hawaiian beacon coming in. So you pick your spot. Here we are down at the beach. And we found that the low level uh, elevation was actually better than some of the higher elevations. The only problem was the interference from the law enforcement that saw this big antenna aimed out to sea. And um, we said we were tracking whales. Oh, 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 tracking. Oh, okay. All right. See ya. Had we explained we were ham radio and transmitting, we would have probably been kicked off the sand. But <laughs> you never know. But that was our contact uh, with Hawaii uh, right on the beach. You don't need huge antennas for tropo. But most important, you do need to know polarity. And that is, if you're trying to pick up a tropo signal from Hawaii Beacon, it's horizontal. If you're trying to pick up some of the Hawaiian stations uh, driving up the mountain roads on uh, FM, that is vertical. And we thought, well, does the tropopheric ducting uh, rotate? And the answer is no. The propagation remains the same without any rotation, without any phase distortion. It's amazing. It's like waveguide. And as you know, with waveguide, polarization is critical. Well, can we hear the Hawaiian beacon if we're vertical? <laughs> nope. It's just amazing. But turn the antenna horizontal and bango, it comes right in. Well, there's unfortunately less and less weak signal operators that have horizontal systems. 
And there's a lot of great repeaters, FM repeaters, and of course they're vertical. So for those of you with a, a VHF, UHF, dual band, white fiberglass antenna on your roof, uh, during uh, periods of tropospheric ducting, which again, you can literally see, make sure that you have uh, the vertical antenna in place when you're tuning in FM signals uh, down on 146.52 or 445 or 446, and you will get some surprising contacts. So um, for working the beacons and weak signal work, the horizontal loop is a good way to go. But for working uh, non-sideband stations, uh, uh, even digital stations, uh, they are generally vertically polarized. And yes, you can easily work them mobile. So yes, QTH is everything. Here, down at the beach, CHIP, K7 Juliet Alpha. Here, CHIP is uh, getting ready to uh, beam a signal to Hawaii. He's horizontal, so he's going to be working uh, some of the weak signal operators. But we also have a vertical antenna not seen in this photo. So when we're working the Hawaiian stations at our FM, uh, they're going to be off the vertical. So for those of you in the Midwest and uh, the other side of the Rocky Mountains from us, your tropo path is huge because you have no huge mountains that obstruct comms from where you're located, maybe near the Canadian border, all the way down to Texas. And it's all dependent on the weather. And as you can see, uh, headset, and we're on the air with just a modest radio. So the prize, of course, for those of us on the West Coast is uh, Paul. Now, notice he's up at 8,000 feet, yet the best reception at the other end of the downward tropo, which sort of slants down, is uh, right at deck level. And uh, you can see that Paul is just above the clouds in the background behind him. And uh, those of us on the West Coast will drive and find a hot spot. And usually they're not much higher than 100 or 200 feet. For those of you in the Midwest, uh, your hot spot is probably right there at almost deck level. In fact, you can actually go to the top of a skyscraper parking garage and sometimes be out of the duct and hear squat, yet your buddy down there on deck level says, I'm hearing these mobile stations uh, 190 miles away, loud and clear. So the tropospheric duct, like a waveguide, is very, very selective in its capability. So we encourage all of you to uh, think about uh, tropospheric ducting when conditions get just right. All right, we'll now go back to uh, live. And um, the way we uh, demonstrate uh, tropospheric ducting is get your better half to mix up um, uh, layers of fluid. And remember, the atmosphere is very close to how fluids will begin to uh, develop individual layers based on their uh, density. And remember, density is mass divided by volume. And the refractive index of air is one. So when we have a sharp change in the refractive index of air or a sharp change that we have here uh, in these suspended fluids, uh, it's going to do something magic that we'll talk about and that it's going to reflect and sometimes refract different radio signals for literally as far as these two or three layers begin to um, form up and become uh, uh, quite distinct in their boundary. And um, so we'll go ahead and remind folks that you first pour into uh, the bottom of uh, the uh, dish here, honey, uh, which has a, um, a refractive index of 1.4. Then the blue, a little hard to see, is Dawn Dish Soap, refractive index of about 1.06. Water, a refractive index in this case of one. And then vegetable oil that is lighter, 0.9er, and alcohol, and that's at 0.7. And um, uh, you don't want to um, uh, shake this because here's what we're looking for. We're going to be able, and you see that bean, be able to come back down. Yeah, it goes up 
and comes back down. Let's see if I can get it over here. No, probably a little, maybe over here and you can see a little bit better. But this is the reflection of a signal inside a tropoduct. So once that signal gets into the tropoduct that you see right here, it will follow that and will just slightly bend back as you can see here, as we do the laser on the suspended uh, fluids. And the angle is very important as well. You'll have much longer communications range if you get right into the tropoduct. However, if you're too high, you'll never get into the duct. And if you're below the duct and there's still enough ducting at that level, it'll begin to reflect the signal and it will go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth uh, in this uh, fluid, uh, as you can see here, uh, until the uh, duct begins to uh, unform. And when the duct unforms, here's what happens bingo, it's a mush, and you're not going to get good tropospheric ducting. So I encourage all of you to consider uh, the uh, great fun of working weak signals. And again, you don't have to if you don't have a single sideband 2 meter 440 uh, rig. Um, you don't have to do just sideband, do FM, and uh, maybe set up a schedule with other hams uh, hundreds of miles away, or just get out there, turn on the rig, and start dialing around uh, the FM band about 146 to 148. Ooh, there's a signal coming in. Listen for a little bit, and he says, yeah, I'm just about ready to go into Key West. Uh, wow, Key West, and I'm up here near uh, Colorado. Uh, we have had reports of tropospheric ducts that have been nearly transcontinental. Unfortunately, you're not going to hear Hawaii because of all the mountains in between us. But on a clear path, especially those of you in the plains area, uh, you're going to get signals from all over. So what I would like to do now, and I've got about uh, 10 minutes before I have to jump out and do another net, is um, if any of you have ever worked a station a lot further, not on uh, ionospheric skyways, but actually tropo, uh, how about a quick report and let's hear who you've talked to. So uh, I'll turn the net uh, back over to our net manager. And uh, thanks for rolling those slides. And uh, who has worked some stations on FM or sideband or CW uh, hundreds, if not a thousand miles away? Over. <laughs> Gordon, thank you very much for the presentation, first of all, and uh, gotten a lot of good comments coming through on the comments. And Danny is our tropospheric man. Is he, is he got a mic open here somewhere? He does now. He does now. Tell some tropo stories to your fellow Californian over there. Well, from California, I did work Hawaii. Oh! On several occasions and work stations in Northern California and uh, um, uh, Washington and Oregon from a Hawaiian repeater. Oh, wow. You went through a repeater. <laughs> that's, a, that's probably one of the longest comms you've ever had, huh? Yeah, it was that way for hours in the morning in Dubai, I guess. And uh, if you gained any altitude, you'd lose it. You had to be down at beach level. Yeah. I was in the uh, city of Palmdale, Torrance, Hawthorne, and uh, I worked in there as all my other buddies. From here in the Midwest, I worked all down into uh, the Caribbean, Cuba, uh, Florida, uh, all the southern eastern uh, seaboards, all over Texas, all the way to Colorado, all the way to uh, the Canadian border, and a couple times into Canada. I'm here, but those are extremely rare. And wow. Weeks and did you make those contacts on sideband or FM? FM. Or? FM and sometimes from my car. <laughs> wow. Well, and I, I bet that was during the summertime, right? June, yeah. July, or August? Yeah. That is great. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, sure hope when I'm next in the Midwest, maybe we can hook up. Thank you for that great report. Well, this has uh, been a fun session because uh, before the net uh, began on Tropo, I was listening to all of you talking about uh, 
uh, some of the great experiences we've had in ham radio. Certainly, we all embrace digital communications. We all embrace uh, the FT8 and all of the wonderful modes that uh, absolutely get through when you don't even hear that a signal is there. And uh, my frustration is that um, it's not the thrill anymore of being able to actually hear the weak signals coming through and uh, driving around and finding a hot spot. Um, we, we don't wanna lose that. So I encourage all of you to uh, continue to stay active. Yes, go digital uh, with your computer and work many of the weak signal digital modes, but don't forget there's still a lot of us out there that enjoy just plain turning up the volume and listening and uh, making adjustments on our gear and uh, making the contact live and direct. So this is Gordo, WB6NOA. Wanna thank my wife, Susie, in 6GLF. She is the one that comes up with the uh, concoction. I'm sorry there's no more alcohol at the top of the uh, tropo uh, layer here, but uh, the cat may have licked it or something like that. But uh, a, very, a very warm, and we hope in version uh, 73 uh, to you all. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to make one of those uh, those tropospheric jars. That might get you a, get a reason to have one of those hanging around. Oh yeah, they're I'll fun. The picnic. Yeah, the picnic could be a great deal. Found the same thing works 